good morning, friends. Uh, uh, we are going to uh, start uh, this instruction course on uh, practical pearls in the surgical management of complex retinal detachment. So uh, in this, uh, we're going to have, uh, in fact, uh, four presentation. Uh, Dr. Shali is not uh, with us here in the meeting. Uh, and we also have uh, uh, in this a keynote address. And uh, the keynote address uh, would be uh, delivered by Dr. Nikul Bhatt. And uh, uh, Dr. Nikul Bhatt, uh, I would like to introduce you uh, to you here. Uh, Dr. Nikul Bhatt uh, has, is from Mumbai, basically. Uh, he was a fellow uh, in Sankar Nitralaya, long time back, all the way in 80s. And after that, I remember when I was in USA, he spent uh, some time in USA. And uh, after that, he came back to Bombay hosp Hospital. And for the last 20 years, he has been a vitreo retinal surgeon in Bahrain. And uh, he's been uh, always uh, uh, a very active uh, uh, as far as the vitreoretinal surgery is concerned, and his interest uh, both uh, in AIOS, Vitreoretinal Society, and otherwise visiting India. Uh, he's been coming very frequently. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Nikhil Bhutt uh, to come over for his keynote address on uh, endpoint in uh, vitrectomy surgery. Hello, uh, good afternoon, and I uh, uh, would like to thank uh, Dr. Dogra and the team for giving me this opportunity. And uh, uh, the, the purpose uh, of any vitrectomy surgery is to achieve the goals, and uh, be it uh, reattaching the retina, removing the vitreous opacity, relieving the traction, or removing the fibrovascular tissue. But it should be done in such a way that you just do enough and no more. You don't want any complications, basically. So what I would like in this short uh, talk of you know, 10 minutes to go through some of the highlights, some of the important points, which, uh, uh, which are basic points, uh, which I put into practice, and that enhances the results. And then later on, I think more complex aspect will be taken up by other speakers. Uh, the first point uh, I would like to highlight is uh, through this video. Uh, this is a case of a proliferative diabetic retinopathy premacular hemorrhage. I think the let motif of this talk is going to be removal of this posterior hyaloid face. 
in all cases, you need to remove the hyaloid phase as much as possible. And once you remove the hyaloid phase, um, you have the vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, in this video, my main point I would like to show you would be at the end. So basically remove it. And now I, I think people should spend at least 20 to 30 seconds in all surgery. Just do a little bit of hypotony and see if there is any bleed that is there or not. I think it's very vital. If you don't do this thing, then next day, neither doctor will see inside anything, nor the patient will see outside. So it's better to spend 30 minutes, uh, switch off the infusion, do the hypotony, and identify the bleeder like that. Again, reconfirm it whether it's stopped or not, or you do the laser again. I think it's very vital, simple point to do it. Uh, so next day, if you do that, then the, then, then the eye is like that. So first point, a simple point, please identify all the bleeding points at the end and treat it. And that's why I got a little bit of uh, reservation regarding this sutureless uh, sclerotomy because I like the pressure to be a little on the higher side. And I, I found that I don't get that pressure when I use this self-sealing sclerotomies. Uh, most of the people who are sitting here must have done uh, I must, they, they must be doing vitrectomy. And there are certain situations that are quite frustrating. That you are doing a nice surgery and you come across a patch of fibrovascular tissue and it bleeds. And you spend sometimes more time tackling that bleed than the actual surgery. So let me show you a few films what I do now. Oh, I think the videos are not, uh, ah, okay. So basically, after you remove this, um, most of the opacities and this thing, as you see here, I'm remo trying to remove the last piece and the bleeding starts. It's a very common situation. And sometimes you, whatever you do, you cannot do anything. So nowadays I just leave it like that. I, I don't remove the whole tissue. I see there is no active bleeding and then just uh, uh, do the laser. Uh, mostly tamponade is not required. And the results usually are a nicely regressed uh, 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 fibrovascular tissue. Again, the same point I want to uh, emphasize, uh, another case. And some point you come, it bleeds. Uh, so wha what do I do? That I first see that any, besides the epicenter, I, I cut off all the attachments. So basically a, fat fibro a flat fibrovascular tissue, I'm trying to make it into a form of a flower. So all the fractions are relieved and all the bleeding points are taken care of. Some people might just do the cutter and chop it off, but it bleeds a lot. You don't want to take that risk. So in this case, since it was a large piece, I put a silicone oil in the eye and after two months I removed the oil. So this is when I'm removing the oil. You see nicely that is almost dissolved, nicely regressed new vessel. And this is the fundus picture of the same showing the thing. And just one more video will show the same uh, point which I want to raise. Here again, most of the things are removed nicely and you're removing this fibrovascular tissue and you come across uh, one patch which you cannot do it. So again, I do the same and you will see the nicely regress. Again, please don't get a wrong impression. In most of the cases, we are able to remove all the fibrovascular tissues. But in some situation, the bleeding happens and you are stuck. And before that, I have tried, try to remove that and it bleeds again, remove the clot, again it bleeds. So it's safe to lift, uh, leave behind as long as you relieved all the traction. Now let me uh, show you, okay. Now, uh, let's, this is very important. Way back in 1970 when Bob Markimer came out with his first monogram on diabetic vitrectomy, he said, that the posterior cortical vitreous is most important and it acts as a scaffold for causing a fibrovascular tissue to grow on this. And he emphasized, I think it's very pertinent today. The reason I tell, because a lot of videos are being shown that they use the cutter. I will show you what I do to remove the posterior cortical vitreous. And cortical vitreous has to be removed. So to remove the cortical vitreous completely, I would prefer an unblocked technique which removes it full 
and you have to identify vitreous species, which is a, as high as around 30 to 40 percent in a diabetic vitrectomy. So to do that, um, I'll show you with an example. Uh, this was a case. Uh, this was a case of a, a tractional maculopathy. Uh, along with that, the, uh, the patient had a proliferative diabetic retinopathy and uh, totally attached uh, cortical vitreous. So basically, I, I what I do is wherever I try and uh, find a plane in between the cortical vitreous and the retina, uh, I enter the scissors. I basically use two in, uh, instruments, uh, scissors and the bent needle. And you identify all the epicenters. It's very vital. And you cut those epicenters. Uh, sometimes you can strip it, but you will see very soon that I was over enthusiastic. I try to strip and what happens. So once you have enough of the uh, hyaloid, this thing, you cut off. Otherwise, you'll transmit all the pressure from here, uh, all the traction from here to the periphery, and you can get a dialysis in the periphery. So once you do that, you remove the rest of the cortical vitreous. And as, you s as I was saying, that uh, if you just too uh, overexcited, you can make a retinal tear. Luckily, there was no bleeding. And nicely, all the cortex is removed. And the last, because of the uh, traction on the macula, is uh, preferable to remove the ILM as well. And after doing that, just do the laser, and air is OK in this patient. So the patient mostly recovers good, and the, the macula goes back. Uh, just to emphasize that point again, uh, the, sa the same situation, you get a cortical vitreous nicely attached. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, if you don't remove the cortical vitreous, it's like doing a cataract surgery, and you don't remove the posterior subcapsular opacity. You have to remove the cortical vitreous, whether you are doing a case of a diabetes or you're doing a non-diabetic case, cortical vitreous needs to be removed. And again, this, the concept is same. Once you are, uh, uh, once you are, uh, uh, identify all the epicenters. And sometimes the blood is there, actually, I don't remove it first. It, uh, it helps you to find the plane between the retina and the, and the cortical vitreous. And uh, you remove strip again. If you do unblock, you are sure that you are not leaving any vitreous behind. Identifying the vitreous kisses, and the whole uh, vitreous is nicely removed. Uh, this is another, this is just to show, highlight the point of a vitreous You see, there are two layers of vitreous. Here it is easy to identify because both the layers are opaque. Sometimes a very, very clean layer, uh, clear uh, vitreous remains, and that you have to identify and remove the both the layers of the vitreous. So unblock technique is important. I'm coming to the end, so maybe I will. This is just a very quickly, I'll make a point about this per Peripheral uh, traction uh, with retinal detachment, I find are very difficult. I, I, I normally don't go to remove all the fibrovascular tissues in the periphery. I'll make vertical relaxing incisions. Sometimes it's required just to support it from outside with a buckle. And very, very rarely I do the relaxing retinotomy. But most of the time it does work. You just relax as much as possible. Don't go and try to remove all the things uh, in the periphery. So this is the same patient. So basically what I would end with three simple things. Uh, first thing is that spend 20, 30 minutes, identify all bleeders. I think it's very important. Lot of times when you do, I, I remember when earlier when people vitrectomy, they used to do the incidence of post of bleed was as high as 70%. You have to identify the bleeders and keep the pressure a little bit higher. That's number one. The knowledge says you remove all the fibrovascular tissues. The aim is also the same. We remove it, but sometimes be wise. You can leave behind a part of it. It doesn't cause any damage. Unless two things are there, there is no active bleeding, and all the traction from there is relieved. And last, I think the sine qua non of all vitreous surgery is to remove most of the cortical vitreous, and I, I feel the unblock technique does the best. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nitul. Uh, for giving those pearls. I think it is very important, uh, even with us, I think uh, one place where we are putting suture many a times, despite uh, is the diabetic vitrectomy. We uh, tend, uh, we used to leave it sutureless many a time, and uh, there would be some 
little hypotony and you have a bleed. So we tend to put suture many a times uh, as far as the even the 25 gauge uh, clotting is concerned because you need to leave it tight. So I think, and uh, he has very uh, nicely talked about that. And of course, uh, the removal of the uh, hyaloid itself. Uh, I think uh, we will move on uh, usually uh, with a keynote address. Uh, we may have, if you have any uh, particular question to ask him, we maybe uh, Niti will be happy to answer that. Or we can discuss uh, towards the end. Uh, I would request, uh, uh, maybe I, I'm supposed to talk, I think. Since you can't request yourself, I will request you to come and talk. <laughs> uh, well, friends, uh, I'm going to talk about something which bothers uh, most of us and uh, the where the situation usually turns complex for us and uh, that is the proliferative vituretinopathy. Uh, you know, th this term was coined sometimes in 1983, again uh, by the uh, retina society uh, uh, at that time. And uh, as we all know, only about 5 to 10 percent of all uh, regmatogenous retinal detachment uh, you will have uh, proliferative vitreoretinopathy. And uh, it is more common after surgery. And uh, we have a rather bigger problem. Sometimes if you are not careful and remove the hyaloid nicely and you have put in a gas, you have a very severe and a fast uh, kind of a uh, developing uh, PVR. And uh, of course, we all know we are all vitreoretinal surgeon. Uh, that the PVR is defined as the growth of the and the contraction of these cellular membrane uh, both uh, on the surface as, as well as under the retina. And the PVR is the ma main cause of anatomical and visual fail failure after regmatogenous retinal detachment surgery. And uh, it most often occurs, that's why most of the time when we are doing a surgery, uh, we are telling patients that if your first three months goes well, I think you're going to do well. That's why, because if the PVR is going to happen, it is four to 12 weeks. And uh, it most frequently starts in the inferior quadrant uh, because uh, all these cells, they get liberated and settle inferiorly like in this particular case. You can see how the retina is trying to contract uh, inferiorly and uh, you have a large tear there. And uh, so basically what uh, uh, do you see there? There is a white, opacification of the retinal surface with wrinkles. You may have a posterior rolled edges of the retinal tear, decreased mobility of the detached retina, fixed folds, and funnel-shaped retinal detachment, like this. You may have this kind of increased wrinkling. If you have this, you know the PVR process has already started, and the edge is rolled up like that. So those are, those are the things which you need to look at. Of course, if you have a clear-cut fixed fold like this, then, of course, uh, you are very clear that you are dealing with the uh, PVR here. So I may not really go into the whole detail and both classification, although they are mentioned here. You see, this is the original 1983, which still e many of you, us, we use it. The in A is vitreous haze, vitreous pigment clumps, as well as uh, vitreous clumps on the inferior retina. And I mentioned about the wrinkling. I showed you some examples. This retina gets a little stiffened. You have more vascular tortuosity as well as the rolled and irregular edges of the retinal breaks. And uh, of course, uh, uh, decreasing, uh, mo uh, decreased mobility of the vitreous itself. And C, you have a full thickness retinal fold. If it is in one quadrant, you call it C1. Same way, two quadrant two and three. If all the four quadrants becomes uh, D. And then is the funnel, whether it is open, narrow or a closed funnel. So like this, one ex such example uh, where I think this is Dr. Raman's patient where uh, you have these clear cut folds and sometimes you have a closed funnel like that. Totally, nothing is visible, even the disc is closed. 
and the revised classification was mainly required because they didn't include in the initial classification uh, that was NTA PVR. So most of these, you see, this has been done way back in 1991, revised uh, again uh, by McNamara et al. And here, first and second are same, but third, they included uh, C, it, this kind of a, uh, for the posterior to the equator and anterior to the equator. Whether it is focal, diffuse, or circumferential, full thickness folds, or subretinous tank. So I think uh, most of the time, uh, uh, we may not be using it, but at times it becomes important because we need to kind of go with a particular plan. Uh, so you have a situation like this here. So what you find here is that you have so much of uh, PBR which has developed after surgery that most of this retina looks uh, puckered all around. And uh, basically what are the risk factors? The risk factors are multiple large or giant tear, retinal detachment with choroidal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, prolonged inflammation in the eye, and long-standing retinal detachment, and many a time posterior penetrating trauma. So if you have a large tear, obviously large uh, area is deliberating RP cells, is developed R, uh, this thing. What are the risk factors in an operated eye? That's what is important. We want to avoid that. I think uh, previous RD surgery, I already mentioned about use of gas, and you have not removed the hyaloid, how bad it becomes. Preoperative PVR itself, and failure to remove all tractions from the retina. That is the most important. That's why I colored it a little differently. Of course, if you uh, fail to close the retinal breaks, that will lead to retinal detachment, and you have a incarceration of retina, you've done heavy cryo, or you have a uveitis prolonged, you'll have. So this is uh, one such case where you have after uh, sterile buckling surgery. So the treatment basically, if you have something like uh, Scleral buckling would be good if you do it in the initial uh, sort of stages. Uh, you'll stand very nicely. But if it goes on to C3 onwards, most of the time, you require vitrectomy. And the goals of the surgery are same as in conventional RD surgery. Close all breaks. Relax with your retinal traction. These goals are achieved with great difficulty in PVR surgery. And the early stages, as I already mentioned, especially in fakey kai, in most of the situation, in fake guy, tend to do buckling. But if it is a, a fake pseudo fake guy, no evident break, or you have these ERMs associated with RD or a failed buckle, obviously you need a vitrectomy. So you need to remove these membranes. I think I'll show you all the, those things. You can use various things, forcep, pix, membrane scratcher, uh, or a vitreous spatula. I think uh, uh, some of these examples are given here where Uh, now you have these folds here, uh, so once you have done vitrectomy, what, what, what is being shown here on the corner here, and you have uh, tried to remove that posterior hyaloid, that's very important. But posteriorly, once you have removed, you see those fixed folds there. So you need to get rid of these fixed folds, and once you remove and release these fixed folds, and you have nicely taken care of that, so you will get something what you have down there. You see the last bit of a fold. Mostly you tend to go uh, tangentially towards the periphery, but at times you need to do a little bit of a manipulations. And uh, I think the problem is here. Now this is a very tough kind of a hyaloid here. And it is coming only partly. And despite MVR being used, this is a little dated uh, kind of a uh, surgery, which is uh, I'm showing. And in this case, triamcinolone will help you. You need to put in this triamcinolone and then try to remove uh, the hyaloid with the assistance of a triamcinolone. So uh, one such case where after vitrectomy, the same one uh, uh, is shown here. What about the sphere PVR? That's what is the big challenge. Sphere PVR requires not only partial or vitrectomy. Most of the time, at least we put always a uh, scleral buckle or a sp especially a 240 band. You require extensive peeling, and you may need removal of these 
bands from anterior, posterior, as well as you may need some time anterior base dissection. Relaxing retinotomy and retinectomies, you try to avoid as much as possible, but you may require them, and long-term tamponade is required. So perfluorocarbon is required to be used. I think I'll be showing as a third hand in such a situation. And uh, of course, we tend, as I said, not to do too many retinotomy and retinectomy. And you need a long-term tamponade. Most of the time we use silicone oil, but if you can, you can also at times use CTF-8. So this is the way we just put a 240 band just to support the peripheral vitreous. And after you have put the 240 band, you, I think, uh, yeah. So a, a, a severe PBR, this is the same case which I have closed funnel. You see, it, the whole retina looks like as if it is in plaster. Now we have no choice here. This was one eye child, other eye was thysical and blind for a long time. And you can see how long perhaps this retina must have been detached. The retina is in total folds. You can see it's just kind of puckered there. It was difficult. Now that's where you need that perfluorocarbon as a third hand. And after that, you can identify some more fixed folds or bands. And you can that way remove all these, uh, especially the tougher uh, uh, bands or some other band, and keep on injecting a little more. So in such situation, we all face. And these are the complex situations where we have to be, and here lens had to be removed because the whole thing in the periphery was as if, uh, you can see, this is the giant tear, which is still kind of uh, standing up like that. And, and uh, after this, again, as much as possible, the membranes were removed bit by bit. Keep on doing as much as possible without creating too many hydrogenic problems. And at times, it does happen in these cases uh, that you may have a short retina. Either your PFCL tend to go back, or when you do exchange, your air may go back. So what we do? Many a time I have seen somebody would say, I'll inject more PFCL, the biggest mistake. You have a short retina. So you need, you need not do that, because if you do that, the PFCL also goes behind. I think you need to take care of that. And then only, I think finally here, the oil was injected. And uh, I think uh, even in an extreme case like this, where nothing is seen, uh, ultimately, this is uh, after first surgery. This could settle like that, but still it is dragged down. And then uh, after s during silicone oil removal, this membrane was and uh, had at least uh, a vision which was uh, sufficient for uh, this child. So visual outcome in PVR is functional and anatomical outcomes are dependent on the severity of the disease. Posterior PVR is easily visualized and can be completely removed. And anterior PVR is more difficult to visualize and remove. I think I had uh, one video I just took it out because it will take too much of time. And failed, uh, this is one uh, case which was sent to me, failed SV. Uh, and sometimes they are lucky. You see this case somehow did so well, it uh, 612, which I never imagined that it would. And the prognosis, uh, anterior PVR has the worst prognosis because these are the cases which pose major challenge. Anatomical success will be anywhere between 60 to 80 percent for these kind of detachments. And you may have uh, in 40 to 80 percent something like 5 by 200 or better vision, as I have shown uh, one of uh, such cases. Single procedure has 60 percent chance of achieving 5 by 200. I think if you can fix these retina in single procedures, you are much more successful. If you have to go repeatedly in, I think that is what is shown. They have much lesser success. And the prevention, again, I would emphasize, remove all tractions from the retina during the primary surgery. Support all residual traction with uh, SB. If you're in the periphery, you can always put a band, which we do in PVR cases. We may not do otherwise in conventional, normal cases. But where we find we are not able to remove the hyaloid and we have a problem, and close all retinal breaks uh, meticulously. Avoid or use minimal cryo and use long-term tamponade like silicone oil. So uh, I would like to conclude that in recently performed SB in fake eyes, we form very often a skull buckling with moderate PBR. And especially in children, we tend to go for buckling in most situation until unless it is a really bad situation. So uh, we need complete membrane peeling, 
PFCL may be required as shown in one of the cases. Anterior vitreous based dissection with lens removal or oil removal in so some cases are required. I think we had to remove oil uh, lens in that particular case. Use of retinotomy and retinectomy should be really very, very sparing. I think it because it could, uh, leads to again further PVR enhancement and long term tamponade is essential. And so uh, I think most of the things I have covered, uh, so there's nothing uh, that I would like to repeat here. And so uh, any questions? So I have taken little more time. Dr. Shali is not there, so I thought uh, we still have little time. Any questions or any kind of a comments? Uh, Dr. Gopal, you would like to add something to these cases where maybe further pulse or something you have? No, I think you covered everything quite well. The only thing I would like to add is that don't approach the subretinal bands before you remove the preretinal bands. Means clean uh, the entire surface of the retina before we try to approach subretinal bands. The mistake we will do is in relieving and leaving unrelieved tracts on the retinal surface and make it a retinotomy first because they want to remove the more visible subretinal band. But once you make the retinotomy, the preretinal membranes, which are not obvious, will not be very easily visible. And you leave unrelieved traction, they have a recurrence problem. So first you clean it up nicely, and as you very nicely shown in the video, uh, go back again and again, means stretch the retina so that membranes become more evident. They are not obvious in the first go. Once you clean it up and stretch it with PF seal, they become more obvious. And remove it, and then of course you go to the uh, periphery and uh, make a retinotomy as required. The, the subretinal bands can be removed by either a single retinotomy or two or three I isolated retinotomies, or you can make it a peripheral large retinotomy, fold the retina back and access the subretinal space, depending upon the extent of membranes. It's not that uh, every subretinal band requires a peripheral large retinotomy, not necessarily. And as you again very rightly and emphasized, not all PVR cases need vitrectomy, and especially in children who had a dialysis, for example, or a lattice-related retinal detachments, which are very chronic, and have some amount of intraretinal and subretinal gliosis and shortening of retina, they do actually very well with scleral buckling rather than with a vitrectomy procedure where you end up unnecessarily sacrificing the retina for nothing. And the scleral buckling is all that they need require. So be judicious in how you approach the case. Otherwise, I think these are the basic uh, uh, pearls that he has shared with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, uh, Gopal. So uh, there yes, is please. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, I think that's what is very important. You ask a very important question. That is where perhaps we have learned over a period of time. That means despite your band, whatever surgery you have done, your retina is still not, you see, relaxed in that. It's shorter. So what we do usually is a, we tend to, many people, uh, they have talked to me, they'll put in a PFCL, they try to do more manipulation, try to uh, compress, it doesn't work. So the best is, if it is not getting relieved, if there's a membrane, obviously try to remove it, but most of the time if it is, is not. What we have realized is that we just go directly over that area, cauterize that area, make a little limited kind of a till the time you have that short retina, like a retinectomy. So it will come out, it will relax, because already the band is also there. So that is the easiest thing in such a situation which you are telling, where you have it. But don't leave it there, because if you leave it there, it is going to be going behind, and more of it would come in. Even the oil would go in. So I think it is very important to relax that, so you may need to do a limited, small uh, retinectomy there. But I am scared of retinectomy, yes. and uh, sometimes I have seen that is is FG is done at the level of 30 millimeter of mercury. Yeah. I reduce the FG uh, pressure, intraocular pressure. I do FG at 15 and gradually doing FG. And now there is not air is not going sub retina. So, uh, so whether I should do laser and leave it there or should I do retinectomy? No, uh, never FG? leave, never leave the sub retinal layer there. No, that is what I'm. Layer is not there yes, when I'm doing FG at 15 yes. millimeter. Of yes, mercury. yes. No, that's fine. That's okay. Then if I sub retinal layer is uh, not there, you are fine. But if subretinal air is there, definitely there is a problem. Uh, 
uh, Gopal would like to uh, give uh, some. No, I, I don't think anything specific except that a small rim around the retinal break, there's really no problem. Uh, you can actually stretch the retina by using the soft tip of the cannula and it just smoothens out and gets reattached. What it needed is the retina is a still an elastic membrane and you are able to stretch it to a particular extent beyond which you cannot stretch it. And the contracted gliotic retina is less amenable to stretch than a retina which is still relatively healthy. So when you have a retina which is slightly contracted, not so much, just that the edge is just lifted. So if you stroke the edge with uh, the cotton, with the soft silicon tip, very often it just stretches enough to get reattached with no air underneath that. And the small retinectomy, as he mentioned, doesn't really compromise the success of surgery at all. Uh, doing a little bit of cartilage or even excising that small edge of the uh, retinal break to make it flat doesn't compromise surgery. Already there's a break. You're only enlarging it a little bit. And do you endolize that? I think that should be your point. Thank you. I think uh, with this, uh, we will move on to the next talk uh, by Dr. Lingam Gopal. Uh, you know, he's the authority on the coloboma RD. He changed the whole scenario as well as management for everybody across uh, the globe uh, as far as this part is concerned. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dogra to uh, give me an opportunity to be a part of this course. Um, I'd like to share with you a few slides with uh, specific stress on certain pearls as the topic of this instruction course is on the management of retinal detachments with coloboma of the choroid. It's not that the management of coloboma of choroid or retinal detachments is significantly different from a detachment from rest of the of, of any other eye, but what is important is to understand that uh, what is causing the detachment so that you can manage it appropriately. So the most important contribution has been an article by Dr. Schubert, which has described for the first time, what is visible to us is a break in the normal retina or a break in the intracalorie membrane, but what we fail to see is a break in the communication between the sub-retinal space and the sub-ICM space. So the retina is here, normal retina, the intracalorie membrane is here within the area of the coloboma. So the communication between the subretinal space and the sub-ICM space is not always evident, but that is what triggers the coloboma-related detachments. And that has been beautifully shown in this histopathological study where he has shown that the retina near the margin of coloboma actually splits into two layers. The inner layers, that means the vitriod layers, continue on as the in intercalary membrane, which is a nondescript fibrotic membrane and which is what covers the colobomatous area. While the outer layers don't just stop short and just get attached to the coloboma margin, they actually turn backwards. And these are what are containing photoreceptor layers. So there is a short area where there are actually double layering of photoreceptor layers, and this merges with the retinal pigment epithelium. So that junction is what he called as a site of least resistance, or locus minoris resistentiae. So this is where there must be a break for the subretinal space to communicate with the sub-ICM space, and that's what tr triggers the onset of detachments. Now, this is a study which we submitted, in, we, we published in 1995, where we described the breaks in the intracalorie membrane. In fact, if you read this article, I did not use the word breaks in intracalorie membrane in the article itself. I call them as retinal breaks in the coloboma, for want of a better term. Perhaps the better term actually is breaks in the intracalorie membrane. And what we found was breaks like this, large oval breaks within the intracalorie membrane, or multiple breaks, you can see here there are three breaks outlined by the black arrows, or more often what we saw was where the detachment is like this and spilling over into the coloboma margin in this quadrant, right at this margin you will find a break which is slit-like where the layer, the margin of the break which is towards the normal retina is lifted up, but the margin which is away towards the coloboma is actually merging with the coloboma floor. So it's not visible. So it's not like a full oval break, but it is like a break with half an o uh, oval area which is cut off. 
and that is contributing to the detachment of retina. Now it's not easy to appreciate the small rim of intracalary membrane detachment in all eyes that you see like microphthalmic eyes with severe nystagmus, it may not be easy. So it may not be easy to detect the presence of intracalary membrane detachment in all the eyes preoperatively. So let us consider the variables in the detachment. You can have a break in the normal peripheral retina, you can have a break in the intracalary membrane, and you can have a break at the locus manaris resistance, which is not clinically appreciable, okay? These two are clinically appreciable, this very easily, and this with some difficulty. If you have a only a peripheral retinal break, what do you expect? You expect the detached retina to involve only the normal retina, and it stops abruptly at the coloboma margin. There is no intracalary membrane detachment, and the routine management is possible in these cases, ignoring the coloboma because the cause of detachment is unconnected with the coloboma itself. But you must be sure that there is no ICM detachment. If you are not sure, you better assume that the coloboma could be contributing potentially and manage appropriately. What to do in that situation will come to later. If you have only intracalary membrane break, which is often seen in the fellow eye when they come with loss of vision in one eye, what you find is only a intracalary membrane detachment. It doesn't spill over to the normal retina, and hence the visual acuity is still not affected. Now these are the eyes which are potentially at risk for spilling over and causing loss of vision, and hence are a good indication for prophylactic retinopexy along the border of coloboma, very strongly recommended. But if you have a break at the locus manas resistance alone, it is something which is probably not possible because you require pull on the normal retina or the ICM for the break between the two to occur. But you, what you very often see is a break at the locus manaris resistance with a break in the ICM with or without a peripheral retinal break. This is the most common uh, way of presentation to the uh, clinician. Then you find a retinal detachment in the normal retina along with an ICM detachment which is variable in extent. And the break in the ICM is not always discernible clinically and a peripheral break may be present, may not be present, means it may not be contributing. So if there is no peripheral break, then there has got to be an ICM break for the liquid vitreous to go into subretinal space through the break in the ICM. If there is a peripheral break, there need not be an ICM break because the vitreous, liquid vitreous can go from the peripheral break into subretinal space. So you need some entry for the liquid vitreous to go into subretinal space first. So whether it is starting from the subretinal space and then lifting up the ICM because there's a communication established between the two, or it is starting from the ICM detachment and spreading upwards to normal retina is something which can happen in a given eye in any particular way. So when we manage these cases, the variables we face with are the size of the eyeball, lens opacity, coloboma virus, disc involvement, macular involvement, PVR. I may not be able to cover everything in the 10 minutes time, but I'll quickly go, go over what we can. So in retinal detachment, traction caused by the ICM on the margin of coloboma could be also a potential problem. So it can keep the edge lifted up, and hence your laser that you do, or one or two rows, may not be able to anchor the retina along the margin, and it can actually get lifted up despite your it looking good on the table. And a chronic detachment along the border of coloboma may be there to start with so that the retina around the coloboma margin has been contracted because it's been detached for a very long time along with gliosis. So very often you can see a pigmentary degeneration there as well. And then it can spread more rapidly once enough vitreous is liquefied to generate subretinal fluid. So how do we identify the site of communication between subretinal space and sub ICM space? In this picture you can see this is attached retina, this is detached retina, this is the border of detached retina, and this is the area of ICM detachment you can see, and this is the coloboma. And when, you, when we uh, did OCT at this point, you can see the gap in the sub-retinal space and the sub ICM space showing a clear communication. That means this is the break at the site of least resistance. While a little beyond when we did uh, the OCT, there was a point is not showing there. Oh, okay. So if you see, the, uh, the subretinal space and sub ICM space is communicating here due to a break in the uh, locus manas resistance. While at this point, there is no break. So it can be very focal communication. And if we have an advanced notice of exactly where the focal communication is, we can target that area for laser treatment more precisely. But there's a caveat to this. When we manage the case with, during vit vitrectomy, 
we induce posterior vitreous detachment and that can be a very violent process in these eyes. And because of the violent process, we actually induce more communication between subretinal and sub-ICM space, which probably were not there to start with. So it makes sense to treat the entire coloboma margin when you're inside the eye, rather than think that this, this area alone is having a communication. But of course, there are selected cases like the case which you saw there, where the detachment is only restricted to one half of the retina. The rest of the coloboma margin theoretically can be left untreated. But when you are in, again, you tend to play safe and you treat. So once we operate, we give routine management, careful evaluation of coloboma margin, need, in, need to exclude ICM detachment, as I told you, if need be with OCCs. I'm talking about only peripheral retinal detachment with no ICM detachment, when I know the cause of detachment is an unconnected with the coloboma. But you, you're inside the eye with vitrectomy, you examine the coloboma margin very carefully to make sure there is no ICM detachment, and then you manage appropriately. Sclerotomies have got to be more anteriorly placed than usual because they're microphthalmic eyes, so corresponding to the microphthalmia, you may have to shift them more and more anteriorly. And lens need not be saved in very extreme microphthalmic eyes because then you try to compromise a lot on the amount of vitrectomy you do. So very extreme microphthalmic eyes, I tend to remove the lens. There's a questionable role of encirclage because large colobometa with entire inferior four clock hours or more affected by the coloboma, the inferior four clock hours don't need any support in the periphery. The remaining eight clock hours can perfectly be tamponaded by internal tamponading agent. So you really don't require an encirclage in most cases, provided you do a good thorough vitrectomy. Selected cases, I add encirclage as well. A debulking of the vitreous base is important with the, with the indentation. Induction of PVD is most vital because most cases of failure are because you have not induced the PVD properly. And inducing a PVD, as I said, is not easy. You can start at the ICM and come towards the retina or, vice or other way around using triumphs and loan and using a forceps to peel the vitreous collagen from the disc sometimes helps. If you peel a few collagen fibers and then use suction, it lifts up much more easily than using, keeping on using heavy suction in a detached retina where you always run the risk of sucking the retina as well. And because of this violent uh, detachment of vitreous, the locus minus resistance can break at multiple locations. Once you do fluid air exchange following vitrectomy, and don't suck the fluid to subretinal space just to see the behavior of the retina, you just suck directly over the optic disc or at the coloboma floor, and you see what happens. If the retina becomes bullous and gets pushed towards the coloboma margin, but doesn't spill over into the coloboma, but it remains bullous, doesn't get flattened out, it tells you what? It tells you that the fluid is able to push up to the coloboma margin is not able to get into the ICM, sub-ICM space, and is not able to come into the vitreous cavity. Perhaps there's no communication between the subretinal space and sub-ICM space, or the communication is very small, so it's not able to push through a thick fluid, and it's not able to come into vitreous cavity because ICM break probably is not there. But suppose it balloons, but there's a spillover of the detachment within the coloboma, then you know the ICM also is detached, but it is still not flattening, so ICM break is not probably there. While if it flattens totally, then you know that all three are there, right? This fluid is able to be pushed into sub same space and on into the vitreous cavity. That tells you how the retina is behaving and also tells you how much to treat. Then we do endolaser around the breaks and around the coloboma margin, about two to three rows. Diode laser is preferred because you don't want to damage the nerve fiber layer, especially where the coloboma involves the optic disc. If macula is just cutting the coloboma, very often putting two rows can actually destroy the macula permanently. So those cases, you go as close to the macula as possible, fovea as possible, and leave the just subfovial area without treatment, taking a risk. You are hoping that at that point, there is no communication between subretinal and sub-ICM space. And if the patient develops perhaps a recurrence when you remove the oil, then you have no choice except to destroy the macula. It's important to treat right up to the aura. Means you go along the coloboma margin and where it hits the aura, you go along the aura as well, because your eyes, which are microphthalmic, the aura is closer to the limbus than in normal eyes. So however anterior you make sclerotomy, there's always a risk that the vitreous pull can actually push up, pull on the retina and can cause peripheral dialysis. And hence, you need to uh, treat the entire aura. Internal tamponade is preferred with silicon oil. Uh, can I go ahead with half a minute more? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, gas may be OK in selected cases where only small sector is to be tamponaded. Uh, this is just our ex experience was published in 1998 of 85 eyes. 
uh, we have had success of 81.2 percent with nearly 70 percent having better than 10 by 200 vision it was upgraded into in 2006 the unpublished data which was presented in academy by my colleague dr Muna. and of 126 size their success rate was even better because we learned from our mistakes of one having a good thorough vitrectomy 100 percent induction of pvd in all cases and detaching the vitreous as far into the periphery as possible and debulking the peripheral vitreous nicely and treating all the way along the aura because the initial mistakes we did when especially when we were using mark Mars lens or not a wide angle lens was leaving behind too much peripheral vitreous and having a peripheral dialysis which is undetected and when you remove the oil you find that dialysis is causing the detachment again so now that is not a possible problem with a wide angle lens good thorough vitrectomy and treating the entire peripheral aura the risk of recurrence has been minimized or reduced significantly. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lingam Gopal. Uh, any questions uh, for, yes, please, uh, Dr. Lingam Gopal. Sir, uh, this is a theoretical question. Uh, in case if there is a, the coloboma is not extending up to the periphery of the retina, and there is, uh, and you can't find the tray, and you suspect that the vision is retarded in some way. And we can see that clinically it is in the periphery of the uh, the coloboma. Is it a po is it a role for a uh, puzzle there with a cryo like what we do for a regular? Is there any role theoretical question? Well, if you see very first attempts were with buckle. If you see the first article from IG in IJO was by Dr. B. Patnaik, and he put two radial sponges along the two edges of the coloboma, and he has shown one case with good success after having had lots of failures, but buckling. So far, posteriorly itself is one a problem. And these are small eyes you're talking about, microphthalmic eyes. In a selected eye in a given eye with a small ICM break, yes, you may be able to buckle the ICM break. But is that the only cause of detachment? As you have seen here, the break in the ICM is something we have not, we have not even attended to during surgery. We just ignored it because, A, it is, it is underneath that there is no retinal pigment epithelium or choroid. There is no way you can seal that hole. If you put a buckle, it is like a thermal buckle. A thermal buckles don't succeed. You have to create a choreoretinal reaction, which you cannot. Although, again, there's one study in, the, in 1992 published from Duke University by Dr. Brooke Shields, uh, Dr. Uh, Brooks McEwen. He had one case where he has used cyanoacrylate glue to close a internal ICM break. Again, it was a tiny break which you could close. And you have seen my picture with large breaks from inside. So you cannot close the ICM breaks and we ignore the ICM breaks totally. I treat the entire coloboma as one break and we are trying to segregate it from the rest of the retina. Very often post oil removal I find the ICM may be detached but it is not spilling over beyond the retina. I am quite happy. There is no problem. Uh, any other question uh, to Dr. Gopal? Yes. and the other eye you cannot see obvious uh, break in the ICM. In that case, should you do the endo laser, alo uh, laser along the edge of coloboma in attached retina? See, that is considered as a prophylactic laser, right? Prophylactic laser. So there is no retinal detachment, no ICM detachment. No ICM break. Well, you can do prophylactic because the risk of detachment in the lifespan of a child is about 40 percent, according to Charles Stephens' group, okay? So, but when you do prophylactic laser, you always weigh the risk and benefit. I did not cover prophylaxis because it happened means I can't cover everything. If you have a coloboma not involved in the disc and macula, no problems. Go ahead and straight blast off. Because you are not having at any risk of creating any nerve fiber layer defect or any vision loss. No problem. I would treat 100%. If you have a coloboma involving the disc or coming close to the disc but there is still a space between the disc and the margin and significant space from the macula, again I would treat. But if it is involved in the disc and macula, then you are potentially at risk of creating nerve fiber layer defects if you go around the disc margin. And that's where, especially the attached retina, where there is no fluid cushion to stop your thermal energy from going all the way to the retina. And in a child where you cannot put on slit lamp and you do indirect laser, your ability to titrate the intensity of burn is very less. So you run a risk of producing intense burns suddenly, and those intense burns can actually damage the nerve fiber layer. So you have a risk. If you are willing to take the risk, it's up to you. 
but if the child is uh, allows you to do slit clamp delivery then i will use slit clamp diode laser delivery producing very light burns along the disc margin that gives you adequate protection but there are cases where it's a large like a type 5 uh, coloboma disc where disruption is hardly seen and the macula is also hardly seen their treatment is always risky and if you treat only the extra macular and extra disc part then you are not giving them any prophylaxis really because you're leaving about 30 percent or 40 percent of the margin untreated and this is exactly the place where probably mid-area detachment can start so if you still say okay i will treat whatever i can well you can but you're not giving them the full value of prophylaxis so if you understand these limits and limitations and the implications and the risk of nerve fiber uh, loss then yes you can try and sir if the coloboma is involving disc and bisecting the macula but you cannot see icm break in in that case is there a possibility of break at the level of locus and should we well that's why i said so if you don't see icm break preoperative that doesn't mean it is not there so you go in do vitrectomy and then inspect and with endo laser endo illumination and microscope you can identify the icm break in every case without any problem and even if you don't see the icm break if you do fluid gas extension you know exactly what is happening sir in attached retina also you fellow eye fellow eye okay fellow eye as i said presence of icm break on on the day that you are doing prophylaxis doesn't absence doesn't mean it will not form later right so we are our aim is to as a segregate the entire coloboma from the rest of the retina so you reduce the risk of detachment in the future okay despite your laser it can still happen but let us do what we can uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gopal. Uh, now uh, we have Dr. Ramandeep. Uh, he's going to be, uh, Dr. Ramandeep is a professor of ophthalmology with us in PGI Chandigarh. Uh, he's going to uh, be telling us about the man ma uh, management of retinal detachment secondary to necrotizing retinitis. Uh, he's the one who has a uh, very uh, large experience of uh, tackling such eyes. And these eyes, they pose a big challenge. I think that is what. Uh, He's going to tell his part. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Dogra, for the uh, opportunity and the, uh, to be part of this IC. Uh, so uh, my task is uh, to be talk about the managing the RD secondary to the necrotizing uh, uh, retinitis. So we see these necrotizing retinitis in the patient of viral retinitis, be it because of the, uh, the HSV, BZV, or CMV retinitis. That's uh, a common, uh, uh, you know, CMV we see in the case of HIV patients. And we being in the tertiary center, we lo see a lot of these patients. So there is a lot of destruction in the retina there, and the uh, retina becomes weak, and uh, there is something going on in the, you know, uh, vitreous also. So whenever these changes are there in the retina, so uh, retina heals with some kind of atrophy there. So that edge of a uh, normal retina and the atrophic retina it became uh, becomes a weak area to which, uh, you know, this vitreous can uh, play a uh, uh, spoil sport and it can, it can, it can cause a detachment there in, in the future. Uh, the detachment rate is so high that more than 50% in, in ARN patients and nearly 30% in case of uh, uh, the, uh, the CMV. And uh, uh, we must uh, know that, uh, as I've already told you, there is a peripheral retinitis going on in these patients. And when the heal, the problem starts actually. So uh, see, in this patient, when, uh, uh, the same patient, when the healing has started uh, taking place, there's an atrophic uh, area behind. And this atrophic area and the, this, uh, the margin between this retina and here the breaks can form and it, it will ultimately uh, lead to the detachment uh, in these patients. And if you can pick this detachment and treat them, uh, these patients early, and somehow they, uh, they do well because in them also the PVR can set in very early. And ARN patients, because they are normally uh, uh, not immunocompromised, so these patients uh, uh, can be taken up for surgery early. But CMV patients, you have to uh, talk to the you know, family and talk to the physician and then take up for surgeries. 
and uh, when you uh, uh, before I move on to the you know the RD in these patients, is there any role of a prophylactic uh, 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 the PP, uh, the laser before PPV in these patients? And of course, uh, people have addressed the prophylaxis that doing a barrage uh, around these uh, necrotic areas and trying to prevent uh, RD, which is uh, ultimately they said going to happen in these patients. But uh, th there are no head-to-head -head trials, and some studies uh, show good results, some studies don't show good results. So there, the things are not very simple, as simple as the like in, like in coloboma. So we really don't know whether it does have a role uh, in case of retinitis. In our hands, it, it has never worked wherever I tried. Uh, um, they're doing laser. They have detached the probably. I think b by doing a laser there, I'm causing another, you know, uh, a weak area to which the uh, the uh, vitreous is manipulating and trying to uh, produce. Uh, it acts as a as a, as a as a break there. So it doesn't work in my hand, you know. Uh, so uh, when I move on to the the how to operate, uh, what are the special things which are uh, needed in these uh, patients apart from the usual RD vitrectomy? So whether to do a PPV or a buckle alone. Buckle alone alone is. Is, uh, is is cases with the mild vitreitis where you have a localized quadrantic uh, 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 superior or inferior artery which are the hardly we see these patients one or two patients uh, after a long time majority would need PPV and because they have large and they are of kind of a they 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 are mostly the post secretorial the posterior breaks are there in these patients. So what all is uh, required uh, required in the vitrectomy there you need thorough debulking there. And what is more, uh, what is important here is when are you trying to remove the hyaluron in these patients? The, there is a formation of vitreous stesis there. One thing is most important is whenever you try to go for the overkill, you to tries to detach a retina over the, uh, the hyaluron over the atrophic areas, which tend to cause more damage. So best is just to at the edge of the atrophic and the normal retina. If you, if you are your hyaluron is not coming easily, you shave it off completely and leave it there. Don't don't don't. Uh, go f overboard because you may cause more harm. You will be cr uh, creating large, big tears which uh, you will not be able to manage in these patients. And uh, role of lensectomy because most of the uh, patients you will require, you know, uh, oil in these patients. So uh, lensectomy uh, for peripheral dissection, uh, uh, whether to do or not, uh, it you have to uh, actually uh, take a call. If you have a previous lens opacity is there, people have uh, do did. Faco and uh, oil there, uh, IOL in these patients, and then went out to do vitrectomy. But uh, since the breaks are not peripheral, they are posterior, so lensectomy is most of the time is not required in these patients. But uh, later on, uh, the Faco IOL will give a good rehabilitation to these patients. Again, to buckle, uh, uh, theoretically, uh, uh, people said that you put buckle in these uh, in in these patients, but. Uh, since the PPV is doing uh, uh, taking care of the vitreous, the uh, buckles are uh, not required in all the patients, you know, uh, because the, as I've already said, there's th these are these are posterior breaks, you know, the, uh, the the whole of the peripheral retina is atrophic. The oil will take care of that, but in case you have an inferior RD with an inferior break, which we know that it will be well supported with the with the buckle there, and you can of course uh, 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 go and do a buckle. Uh, along with the PPV in these patients, but for inf inferior atrophic areas, which are far posterior, you don't need buckle for uh, these patients. Of course, exchange fluid air exchange is also you know little uh, whether to uh, there are there will be pre-existing areas uh, through which uh, this can be uh, this can be done. But the issue is uh, you can't you can't laser these atrophic areas. You know this is difficult. So people talk about doing uh, retinotomy in these patients, especially where. The RD is there in the active uh, disease, actually. So you can do retinotomy or you can drain through the, uh, uh, the, the pre-existing area uh, in, in these patients. So how much laser? Laser does have a very good, uh, uh, it has to be done extensively. Apart from the posterior barrage, you have to really go for the anterior edges because sometimes these anterior retina is a normal retina. It is not that tro trophic. You have to go beyond the you know or, uh, beyond the equator to look for these edges and do uh, uh, a laser there in, in these patients there is no role of laser in the atrophic areas you uh, the, the marks they they will not come so you have to c do a barrage kind of a laser along the posterior and the anterior retina and pan retinal photocoagulation sometimes it, uh, it is required in the patients where you know uh, the they are uh, uh, the CD4 has gone up and they are showing the vasculitis and the vitreous hemorrhage and you need to uh, do a panretinal photocoagulation in few of these patients. Uh, oil versus gas, uh, the gas was used initially, especially in case of, you know, on patients uh, where you had 
uh, superior RDs with superior tears, you can use uh, you can uh, uh, use gas in, in these patients. But uh, of course, when you have atrophic areas, inferiorly uh, large atrophic sieve-like retina, uh, the gas will not work there. So you put uh, oil in these patients uh, the for the increased success, and uh, there will be a reduced need for buckle also. So the oil is the end thing. Uh, the gas will be in only for the superior RDs where you are not seeing a lot of the sieve like retina there. Which oil, uh, again, uh, pe people, people, people are uh, uh, fond of using uh, 5,000 or uh, 1,000, which, which one to do? Uh, uh, my take is, uh, I mean, I use uh, for one-eyed patients, I know that these are the uh, CMV, uh, HIV patients, and uh, they, they are surviving. And uh, uh, so I'll be putting 5,000 in the one-eyed patient. And of course, oil acts as a uh, you know kind of a agent which will take care of the antiviral kind of activity. So active disease, you put 5,000 IVLs. This is there. And um, you can use uh, uh, 1,000 or your 1,200 cc uh, 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 Sandy Stokes uh, oil in, in those patients. So what are the attachment r uh, rates there? Uh, the using the uh, complete maneuvers, I've uh, already explained the reattachment rate is uh, uh, good. Merely 90% can be attached, but uh, uh, despite the attachment, uh, we have, uh, because with the attachment, the, uh, the game is not over. You have to have patient with VRD. You, you will have your hypotony in, in, in these patients, and you have uh, sp uh, subsequently the immune recovery. You get like problems in these patients. The visual prognosis, of course, uh, uh, you are uh, operating these eyes which have uh, vasculitis, which has retinitis, and which has botrytis, and you know that their optic disc is uh, most of the time is comp compromised. So you ha you should know that uh, despite of your good job, um, the your visual recovery will depend on the state of optic nerve, and it will depend on the area of the retinitis. If the area is uh, too far, posterior part is involved, so you may not be have good visual recovery. And of course, pre uh, pre op visual activity does have a, a, a role here. Uh, better the vision, the better better the outcome in these patients. Uh, this is one uh, uh, one uh, one of these uh, um, uh, patient where the surgery was done. Um, th th most of the times you don't see th uh, the the active disease along with the RD, but in, th in this patient there was an active uh, active disease going on in this patient. And if you see the, I left the hyaluron in, in 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 that area in this patient. I I didn't go overboard, uh, especially over the active disease because if I if I try to you know trim it uh, too much or try to uh, you know pull it uh, like a normal PVR membranes I may cause uh, a mode uh, damage in these patients so shaving is the uh, best technique in, uh, uh, in these patients I did uh, not me in these patients and then the the barrage laser uh, it is like uh, you know usual two to three uh, rows of uh, lasers are uh, given in these patients before uh, giving a tamponade in these patients This is a, a, another patient uh, where uh, the uh, healed, uh, uh, the atrophic sieve-like retina was there, and of course there was there was a, a involvement of the fovea there. You can see the Schlaren effect there, the large atrophic uh, break there from which the fluid is coming. Uh, so again, uh, after the thorough uh, debulking, and this a, you you also see PVR in these patients because uh, uh, because the sometimes the RDs are old and they uh, do get PVR changes, so you have to relieve the membranes. And just like uh, a normal uh, uh, vitrectomy maneuvers, we do all the maneuvers in this patient also. The PVR was removed, and the fluid gas exchange was done, and it was drained through that large uh, atrophic hole, which was already there. Uh, so uh, the I would end my talk with the carry, carry home uh, tips here in this patient, because you must remember that uh, no longer in HIV patients, no longer these are palliative surgeries because these patients are now surviving for long. So onus is on us that they sh uh, because they are surviving but they can't see. So you have to go for a definite treatment in these patients. You have to put uh, oil in these eyes. You have to later on do cataract surgery also in the eye. We have to sometimes remove also oil in these patients. So uh, good meticulous PPV, SOT, and scleral uh, buckle plus minus uh, is the uh, key to success in this patient. But attachment is not the end of the uh, end of the journey you have to because these patients are surviving and you have to do multiple surgeries in these patients to keep them uh, seen uh, thank you so much for your patient audience. thank you dr aman uh, for excellent talk uh, any questions to dr aman yeah 
Thanks for the lovely talk. I think I have a couple of questions. Yeah. The first one is that you said that you put 5,000 centistrokes for patients who are one-eyed. What's the scientific ra rationale behind it, number one? And number the second question was, uh, well, go ahead. I think if you answered the first one, I'll go into the second. So uh, scientific rationale is just I want the tamponade. I know that uh, the chances of re-RD are very high in, in these patients. So, so is there a scientific so evidence to suggest that 5,000 is more superior compared yes, to Yes, the scientific evidence, they emulsify late. That is the only evidence because the, the oil, the, the problems start with the emulsification. And the earlier is the emulsification, the earlier are the chances of developing, you know, the cataract, the ER, and the glaucoma. So uh, I want those things to happen late, actually. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because sometimes these patients are going oil exchanges also. That's why I'm saying they are surviving. So I, I have a I have couple of more than more than six, seven patients who will need uh, I will exchanges. They are, they are HIV patients. The second question was, you mentioned that um, the vision that patients will get is dependent upon the preoperative vision. I think you know that 50% of patients will have an element of optic nerve head vasculitis. Yeah, absolutely. So they lose vision, not yeah. because of retina yeah. or retinal vasculitis with yeah. hyperperfusion, but rather due to the optic yeah. nerve involvement. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So I think it doesn't really have a bearing on your final visual outcome. Mm -hmm. You get your retina flat and your eye looks good, mm -hmm. but the vision doesn't pick up because ah. your optic nerve is involved. Ah. So the pre-op vision is most In of the In a way, it's, it's not. It yeah. doesn't carry much prognosis. Yeah. The end result depends upon how much is the insult mm -hmm. to the optic nerve perfusion. But what I see is normally if you have a, you know, uh, I have a patient with like 6-12 vision, he detaches, you know. I know that his optic nerve is healthy. But the other patient I have, I know that he's a counter vision, the foveal center is not involved. But I know that because his optic nerve it is gone. So that kind of a thing, before the RD has set in, what kind of vision was there? That's what I meant. Right, because once you have an optic nerve head yeah. vasculitis, That's right. yeah. it takes at least about That's six right. to eight weeks so to manifest. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ramar. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, last talk by Dr. Diksha. And uh, Dr. Diksha is going to, uh, she's a, our colleague uh, from the center. She's a assistant research. Uh, and uh, she does excellent surgeries in these cases of giant retinal tears or choroidal detachments. These are also the situations where we have complex uh, situations which need uh, a different approach. Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank Professor uh, Dogra for giving me this opportunity. So I will be discussing on the management of uh, giant retinal tears and uh, RDs associated with choroidal detachments. So this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, if I'll start with the definition. First part will focus on the giant retinal tears, on its definition, etiology, and the management steps. So a uh, giant retinal tear is a full thickness neurosensory retinal break that extends circumferentially around the retina for three or more clock hours, that is 90 degrees or more. They are not very common. They account for 0.5 to 8.3% of all the cases of uh, regmatogenous retinal detachments, and around 12.8% of these cases are bilateral. The most common location is just po posterior to the ora serrata in 82% cases. They may be equatorial in another 15%, and posterior to the equator, like we see here, are uh, less common, are around 3%. Uh, etiology, uh, a large number of them can be simply idiopathic, 55%. This is followed by trauma in 4 to 31% cases. Hereditary vitreo retinopathies contribute to 14.5% of GRTs. Then myopia, bifthalmos, and also we may have some of them which are isogenic. The fellow eye. 
about as i mentioned around 12.8% of the patients have bilateral joint retinal tears therefore it is important to watch and manage the other eye to prevent these cases the most common predisposing retinal lesion reported in the fellow eye of patients with giant retinal tears is white without pressure areas which are anterior to the equator and parallel to the ora serrata additionally there may be presence of lattice with or without retinal breaks and chororetinal atrophic areas over time uh, th it these have uh, those uh, as reported by freeman et al what changes occur so white without without pressure coalies they develop progressive vitreous condensation which is clinically appearing as a frosted appearance in management pass plana vitrectomy in today's era with either a 23 or 25 gauge is the preferred treatment modality for a giant retinal tear especially those with inverted flaps in case there are no inverted flaps and uh, the pvr is not much there may be that uh, some of them may work with a primary buckle alone but once you have an inverted flap we have to go in and do a pass plana vitrectomy there are certain additional procedures or adjuvants we require which are specific to the case and there are some questions which come along for example whether or not a supplementary scleral buckle is required the use of trimsinolone the use of pfcl in today's era is inevitable and then the use of chandelier illumination and then silicon oil and its injection system the first question to apply a supplementary buckle or not the argument for applying a buckle is that giant tears occur in patients with an abnormal vitreous base and to support this region may prevent tractional forces that may result in reopening of the tear in faking patients the crystalline lens may hinder peripheral base, base dissection so adding a supplementary buckle will help and also it will help in cases with pvr the arguments against applying a supplementary buckle is that you generally tend to cut off the anterior flap so that that means that you have released the vitreous traction there so there is no vitreous traction but the edges of the tear and the remaining retina is what contributes to it and then the major risk uh, is the risk of slippage of the posterior flap and there is there is obviously a questionable role in giant tears which are more than 180 deg degrees extent and there is no role in applying if you have a 360 degrees giant retinal tear so when do you do it if uh, giant uh, the tear extends to less than 180 degrees inferior in location associated with anterior pvr and or there are additional lesions in the periphery which predispose to additional breaks and in fakic patients where you may be not satisfied with the peripheral uh, vitreous base dissection the key to applying is that you apply you do not put indent high you apply a low lying buckle that will prevent the slippage of the posterior flap the second pos uh, the second important maneuver that we have to do while doing a vitrectomy is to reposition the flap of the giant tear we have moved on from the era where sometimes the the surgery used to be done in a prone position to invert that flap because of the use of the pfcl the pfcl has really come to our help it is a high specific gravity uh, liquid lower viscosity that allows easy injection and removal through smaller gauge instruments the tamponading force uh, of pfcl is more than 3 times that of silicon oil thus affording greater mechanical stability to the retina during membrane peeling and vitreous base dissection but we also have to remember that it has lower surface tension compared to air or gas so care should be taken to ensure that it does not migrate subretinally because that is what can happen and then there is also an incidence of uh, fish eggs because the the pfcl bubble breaking into multiple small bubbles for that the bubble the pfcl bubble should be injected slowly and it should remain posterior to the infusion line so this is the uh, two small videos i will show so we be begin with a 360 degrees peritomy once we are planning to add on a supplementary buckle as you just saw that this is a fake ic patient this is followed by dribbling all the recti and generally we don't we use only a 240 band we don't use a tire in these patients after this you, uh, the standard sclerotomy ports are made at standard distance distances from the limbus uh in most of the cases generally we are now using a 25 gauge uh uh instrumentation because now they have become stiffer and they are easier to manipulate and now we have also very high cut rates from 7500 to now the 10000 cut rate cutter is also available so first after do making the sclerotomy ports you do a start with a core vitrectomy this should be done at high cut rates and a little lower aspiration rates because the 
edge of the GRT is very mobile, it can come into the cutter. So most of the times in cases such as this, the idiopathic ones, you have a already have a pre-existing posterior vitreous detachment. So uh, the anterior, the core vitrectomy is done. This is followed by the injection of the PFCL. Now this is an important step. When you are injecting PFCL, start over the disc, you have to and then the, the tip of the uh, injector has to, be has to lie within the PFCL bubble and then the injection has to be slow. So this will prevent formation of the, of the PFCL bubbles. And then you have to take care that you remain posterior to the flap because sometimes this PFCL, if you are injecting fast, it will come into the subretinal space and break down into multiple bubbles. So slow injection of the PFCL with the tip uh, continuously within the bubble will prevent this and you go all the way till you reach the anterior, fla uh, anterior flap. Also once we begin this will act as a third hand it will stabilize it so you can complete the peripheral vitreous dissection trim the anterior flap of the giant retinal tear. After this you follow it up with endo laser, endo, uh, endo laser and then then comes the next step. The question is whether you will do a PFCL oil exchange direct which is the most common trend or you'll do a PFCL air exchange. So the most commonly people will do a direct PFCL uh, and or silicon oil exchange in the at this situation but here I will show a technique which I have learned from Professor Dogra is what you do a PFCL air exchange. So once you begin because this there is a trick to doing a PFCL air exchange once you're doing the PFCL air exchange your soft tip or the extrusion cannula should be remain at the uh, this the the posterior flap the anterior margin of the posterior flap so first you have to dry that anterior flap only then we go posteriorly only then you will be able to prevent the slippage Be if this step is not done sure and short there will be a chance that the that the retina will slip pos posteriorly after this it can be simply followed with a simple oil exchange that is done if you are doing a PFCL oil exchange directly then at this point, this is a, uh, following an air exchange, but if you're doing a direct exchange, then again, there are two methods. Uh, either you substitute the infusion line with the silicon oil injection system and use your two hands to do that. Uh, in this case, the assistant will have to hold that oil syringe while you are injecting. Or you can uh, insert a chandelier here, and then uh, that can provide the illumination, and, use and then, then your two hands are free to do that. This is another uh, video which I will show. This was a post-traumatic uh, giant retinal tear in a young male uh, who presented with history of trauma with a ball. He's a phakic patient, young patient. Uh, in this, once we have applied the supplementary buckle, we start with the vitrectomy. Like I mentioned that uh, typically the definition of giant tear means that there is a pre presence of a posterior vitreous detachment. But in these cases, the, the vitreous may not have detached. So it is very important to inject the triamcinolone and induce a, a posterior vitreous detachment if to and to see that if it is not present to induce a posterior vitreous detachment. After you have uh, induced the PVD, yes, so after you have induced the PVD, especially in cases which are very posterior, because you have a large anterior flap you cannot go all the way and trim the whole of the anterior flap. So you have to be very carefully go and dissect out vitreous by the shave mode of the cutter and uh, and it is particular and particular interest has to be given to the edges of the giant tear. So make sure that you trim the vitreous of the edges of the giant tear here on both sides. In this situation, once you inject the PFCL, just keep it posterior to the posterior flap because that will act as a third hand and it will facilitate the peripheral base dissection. After this, the standard steps are completed like I, I had shown in the uh, previous surgery. For want of time, I'll just skip this video. And then the uh, retinopexy, and another question is whether you'll do a 360 degree laser or you'll just laser the giant tear. So there is wide variation in the extent of application of laser so there are no randomized trials, but the anatomic reattachment rates reported to be higher with a 360 degree laser compared to eyes with laser alone to the giant tear. So PFCL oil exchange, the advantage, it, it reduces the chance of retinal slippage, but it has a learning curve. 
So avoid filling PFCL up to the infusion line to avoid smaller PFCL bubbles falling and it can be done by manual or with the help of an assistant. Silicon oil versus gas. Can you ever use gas? The answer is yes, it can be used. Though the uh, uh, reported anatomic success rates are much higher with silicon oil. But there is only one randomized control study published by Batman et al. in 1999 where they compared 47 eyes with giant uh, tears receiving either C3F8 or silicon oil and they found no significant difference between the two groups. So these are the, the same two patients I have shown. The intraoperative complications can be extension of the tear during vitrectomy, tear slippage, retinal folds, persistent rolled retinal edges, subretinal PFCL, PFCL fish eggs, raised intraocular pressure du during the PFCL silicon oil exchange. And the postoperative complications could be residual PFCL, it may lead to photoreceptor toxicity under the fovea and corneal decompensation if it remains too long in the anterior segment, progression of cataract, recurrent detachments with PVR. And the causes could include anterior traction, reproliferation at the edges of the tear, mixed missed breaks, presence of concomitant macular holes, and the occurrence of PVR. So the pearls are that trimming the edges of the tear well, identifying all the distant breaks, injecting PFCL slowly as a single bubble, removing all anterior fluid by driving, drying the edges of the giant tear thoroughly to prevent slippage. PFCL air or PFCL oil exchange works, both can work, but they have learning curves to them and a long-term tamponade ne is needed whether you do silicon oil or maybe C3F8. Now quickly I'll just go through choroidal detachments. Uh, they might have other uh, no people no, no, coming in. So I think we'll uh, stop at that and if there are any questions so that that will be fine. So they were very wonderful videos. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to ask, this is regarding the post-traumatic uh, giant retinal tears that you uh, demonstrated. Sometimes just posterior to the posterior flap, we also have uh, area of retinal edema, uh, especially in cases of blunt trauma. Any tips or pearls uh, in uh, inducing PVD through that area? No, PVD, you, so you start at the disc, you generally don't go into the posterior pole. Most of the time those, those areas of concussion will be located in the posterior pole. So you, because you start the PVD from the disc, you can be slow, don't use too much suction. Just from the, from the disc when you're doing, you use the suction and then just once you're going, just, just don't use the suction, just use a cutter and do it gently. I think it can be done in most of the cases. So that uh, in cases where you add buckle to the uh, cases, uh, do you tighten the buckle before uh, proceeding with the yes. vitrectomy? All cases. That doesn't really shorten no. the no thing which helps. No. You just have to make sure it is not too tight. But in all the cases, it is tightened before. You retight it after that? No. Okay. Thanks for the elegant talk. Um, got a couple of questions for you yeah. as well. For example, I work in UK. I'm not in. I'm not based in India at the moment. So the question is, number one, uh, you mentioned going through an intermediate phase of air fluid exchange before putting silicon oil. Why, why is that? Why do you want to do that no, no, step? That's just, I was saying that instead of the PFCL oil exchange, this is an alternative. Sometimes that this was what is done. This can be done as an alternative to it. But if you have oil, there's much easier to inject. I think yes, uh, but there is a I learning curve to it. I would it, just I think, like so. to answer this because I think it started with me in an era when there was no chandelier, uh, nothing. So I think uh, when we uh, started uh, doing it, I always felt that if I have removed the hyaloid nicely, right. and it will also serve as a test for me okay. that lettera is not going right. back. Right. And it worked all the time very well. Right. In fact, I have stopped doing direct exchange any time now. Okay. I feel very comfortable. You just keep your uh, suction near the edge sure. and let it slowly uh, kind of get dried up, it will never slip. Right. So maybe because I started and you don't uh, need additional chandelier, you don't need additional things, so it works very well. Sure. So I think that's what little also bit she has done. It also there's a uh, surgeons in my, I, I to tell you frankly, in my hands also direct PFCL exchange, whenever I have done it, a lot of times you'll have retained PFCL on this next day yeah, or bubbles seen, forming. So there is a learning curve to PFCL oil exchange. This I have seen of other people, those who have done direct, 
they may have certain issues. There is a little PFCL left yeah. behind. Perhaps their visibility goes down. Here your visibility, so everything is under control. Sure. And once you have completely done exchange yeah. and the retina is nicely flat, you can inject like in any other case oil very nicely. Do anything, whatever you wish to. Sure. I think you have a more room to play around. But once you have with the direct perhaps, yeah. but, but I have no nothing against okay. yeah. doing yeah. most people does yeah. that. Sure. Right. The second question was, uh, you were injecting a silicone oil mechanically. Why not use a machine? I got a no, 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 I was injecting through the machine only. Okay, yeah. all right. So I thought you were the injecting VFC the no. It was through the VS VFC yeah. only because since it's an instruction course, that's why I just put that because, you know, sometimes you feel that if you don't know a direct PFCL oil exchange, means what? how will you manage? Sure. So that is... No, the reason is because um, I did not get GRT for last one year okay. and last month I had three GRTs. Okay. Mm, very good. Yeah. So I put buckle in all those patients. It worked very well. And then I put oil. But in spite of putting a buckle, the uh, the edge of the tear falls nicely on the buckle. Yeah. So everything's fine. But even after putting oil, there's a slight slippage. There's a slight roll back of the retina. And then post-operatively, I posture this patient. And I don't know what's your view on posturing this patient on silicone oil. That's a bit controversial, but I do it and it seems to work very well. I, I, I think it's fine. It works very well. And uh, sometimes it does uh, create a problem because we know these are younger patient. At times we are not able to remove everything. Sure. So because of that also we may have a little issue that at places it tend to do that. If that is the situation then one has to take care of that once you are removing the oil later yeah. on. Yeah, but yeah. what I'm saying is the mild slippage yeah. that yeah. happens when you put oil yeah, that's gets why corrected when you start posturing this patient. Actually that is how if you don't do direct you can correct it there and then. Sure. You go uh, and nicely you can do everything, whatever maneuver you want to. So that's how maybe a person like me feels more comfortable doing that because right. everything, you know, is now set. Yeah. So what perhaps under oil you becomes a problem, maybe by positioning it too. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Thank you. Uh, with this, I would like to thank all my co-instructors as well as all of you here. And uh, I think... Uh, there was a good discussion. Thank you very much.